Harrison. What's up, man? Thanks for joining us today. I uh, appreciate the time, guys. Yeah, we're excited to have you on. I mean, you've been super active in the community. You've been a, a leader, a voice for players in the NBA, a role model for people outside of it. So I wanted to kick off and, and just get a little sense of what inspired you originally to kind of give back to the community and, and be involved in social justice work. Man, I mean, I think that what started with me with giving back started from my mom, actually. Um, growing up, she had a place called Suit of Work Clothing Closet where if you were unemployed, you could come in and get clothing to wear for the interview. And if you got the job, then you come back and get uh, more clothes. And my sister and I, you know, would always go with my mom. We had to help change out the clothes for the different season and get the donations and things like that. But, you know, when you really started to see the impact that it had on people, you know, it just kind of just put like a little seed in my mind, like, man, you know, someday if I had the opportunity to help out somebody else, you know, I want to try to, to do that for them because I've seen what it's done for, you know, these people that, you know, my mom has been able to help. And then on just speaking out in terms of social justice, that was simply just a matter of what's going on in, you know, my community, you know, the African-American community and, you know, how many of us are there in the NBA and what's going on is simply, you can't separate them. You know, you can't say, well, this is going on outside of the court, but inside the lines or inside these venues, you know, we're not going to speak about that. So it just became just about bridging those two. And obviously you've given a lot to single mothers and it sounds like your mom has had a huge influence on you and your upbringing. What have you learned about your work, her work ethic and how has that helped you? Well, I mean, I wouldn't be here today, you know, without her work ethic. Um, you know, she was always determined that my sister and I were not going to be viewed as less than, you know, she was going to work as hard as she could to provide opportunities for us you know, stressing the importance of education, stressing the importance of having a plan, stressing the importance of just kind of always, never never settling for just getting by, always trying to strive for more. So I think that, you know, was really just kind of instilled, instilled in me at a young age to, you know, I see how hard she's working. Let me not let all that work, you know, be for nothing. I love that. You know, moms are always the best, right? Especially when you can have that connection and you can be inspired by her. So I, I love that story. Um, I'm curious because you, you know, you were always a star athlete gr growing up from high school to being a star at North Carolina. Um, but when did kind of the disparities between um, in the black community really become to the forefront for you? Like, when did you start to see that this was a systemic issue, not just um, kind of a local or even from the work that you were doing in the community? When did you see the bigger picture of that? And I mean, I think you see that at a young age, just with travel basketball. You know, you see, you go to these, you know, these elite camps and, you know, you, you're talking with everyone and, you know, this guy's from Florida, but he's going to a private school in Texas or this person's, you know, here, they're going there. And, you know, it's so interesting that everyone has to do all of these, jump through all these different hoops to try to get to the next level or get the best exposure or try to get to this certain place. And then when you get to college, um, you know, the disparity most of the athletic departments look like versus what the general population of the campus looks like. So I think you start to see that as you get older, you start to understand the dynamics. And then, you know, once you become a professional, you have to learn the business side. So it was a, just kind of a steady progression of just seeing the track that I was on and, you know, who were those that were around me. And Harrison, obviously you had a great career at UNC and you do talk about those disparities, right? When you notice kind of how it was for you being, you know, a black athlete on campus at a PWI. And now we're starting to see more and more of these high school athletes uh, consider HBCUs. What does that next step for them look like? And what advice do you give to them for that? And I think it's great for, you know, any of the younger high school players, um, male and female, to consider going to an HBCU because, you know, the, ba the basketball is going to be the same. Now, from an institution perspective or from those who have means who can give back, it's about providing the resources to make sure that the facilities are on par. You know, no kids should say, well, I wanted to go to this school, but their facilities can't compete with that school. And I think that's the biggest 
hurdle that I've heard from whether it's younger players or whether it's coaches who have been at these schools saying it's hard for me to recruit because, you know, our locker room, our weight room, or, you know, our recovery, you know, having a cold tub and things like that, we just can't compete with some of these bigger schools that have, you know, these big endowments. Yeah, for sure. No, and, I, and I hope that the wave of these young people going there brings more attention. And, and we've seen what Deion Sanders has been able to do. So I think that wave is going to continue and, and I'm excited about it as well. But I want to I want to transition the conversation over to the NBA days because, you know, you came into the league, you had a lot of success early. You're an NBA champion. Uh, but recently uh, you got the NBA Cares Community Assist Award. So I want to hear about that kind of what went into it and, and where you kind of rank that within your, your accolades in your career. Cause there's plenty of, them. man, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that one's up there just because it was, it wasn't anything that I saw happening, um, uh, coming to the league, you know, I definitely wanted to get involved and I've been lucky to play in a lot of great markets and get to know those communities. But there are so many guys in this league that, that do so much. I mean, you got, you know, LeBron opening a school, you see what Steph's doing in Oakland with his foundation, you know, Malcolm Brogdon, you know, with the work that he's doing. Um, so many different players do so much. So to be able to be acknowledged for the work that, you know, my wife and I do um, in Oakland, Dallas, now Sacramento, uh, back home in Iowa, I think was um, just a testament to what we're, what we're trying to build. It's absolutely incredible and amazing and $500,000 this year alone. And when you think about those eight charities where each one you're donating $25,000, what went into selecting those? Because obviously different causes and then what's extremely important to you? I mean, when the bubble first got started, there was so much going on at the idea of, of playing basketball was almost secondary to what was going on in our in society. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, for at least the eight games that, you know, I played in each one of those games was about something bigger than me. So, uh, you know, say their names was a name that I chose on the back of my Jersey. I wanted to highlight foundations that, you know, were about the victims of police brutality. But the fact that also a lot of those victims foundations, they were started by the family members, the people that were, you know, have to carry on that legacy of not only that person, but that story of, you know, why was, you know, my son, why was, you know, my daughter, why was, you know, my child in this situation where, you know, they lost their hands, they lost their lives at the hands of police. And how can they, you know, educate more people and not let their stories be swept underneath the rug. So that was, you know, a big thing that I wanted to do kind of going into the bubble. Yeah, that was, that was very special um, and very thoughtful of you. Um, and I, and I saw that, you know, you, you and your wife set up a Zoom with some of those families, uh, which, which must have been, you know, heartbreaking, but uplifting at the same time. So I'm curious, you know, what the takeaway was after talking to some of those families directly and, and what are those next steps that can kind of help you know, better this issue? It was deep. I mean, just to be able to get on the phone and, you know, share in their pain. You know, a lot of people, you know, you, you see these stories that, that happen on TV and, you know, maybe for a day, a week, you know, you, you feel some type of way about it, but the next news cycle continues to go. So just hearing, you know, what's going on in these situations, hearing that some of these victims' cases haven't even been you know, brought to trial yet, you know, they haven't even been put on the docket, you know, how do you continue to, you know, the importance of staying relevant and continuing to force those issues, continuing to say their names, continuing to bring awareness because there's always going to be another cycle. There's always going to be something that's going on in society that's going to pull us away from that because it's a very uncomfortable issue and change happens very slowly. But at the same time, each of these cases are individuals and each of these cases need justice. That's, yeah, that's incredible. I can only imagine kind of how it was on those Zooms and even during that time, but I'm sure they were super supportive and also grateful too, um, just of how involved you are and how much you're giving back. And I do want to transition it over to the NBA Foundation because 
you know, you're one of two players, two current NBA players serving on the board. What does that mean to you to kind of just have that type of honor and to just be respected like that? It means a lot uh, just to be on that board. The whole focus of it is, you know, to really attack the disparities in economic opportunities, educational opportunities, you know, income producing opportunities. So to be able to really kind of go in with the, not only the wealth, but the influence of all the people associated with it and the vehicle that it can be used to, to bring in change is huge because on one side, it's important to, to bring awareness, to educate people. But on the other side, you do need the dollars. You do need the infrastructure to, to really push that change and instill all of the goodwill that you're doing over here into, into change. So, you know, it's, it's really uh, the start of something big. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, I think we're all excited about it, right? Like we saw that historic movement that took place in the bubble and in the NBA and the WNBA and athletes really being at the forefront of social justice and the forefront of the messaging kind of being pallbearers for the word. So um, with the foundation, you know, where do you see that going in the future? Like you, you said it can be big. I, I hope it can be big, but what are some of those kind of strategic next steps? What are, you know, where do you want it, want it to be in five years? Like just kind of broadly. Well, I think right now it starts with supporting the organizations, you know, recently uh, last week we just came out with the gr initial grants that are going to happen, but it's important the organizations on the ground now that are doing this work. Um, it can take a while to build your own infrastructure and to build your own program. So, you know, we want change now. We want to support and put those funds to work. So finding organizations that are doing good work um, recently uh, are just kind of fielding pitches of how we want to move things forward. And the biggest thing that we want to try to do is move effectively and donate the money as quickly as possible, but also just be strategic and think, you know, long-term, how can, you know, we stretch and impact and bring in, you know, more resources to make this, you know, a five or 10 year project. That's a good point. And Harrison, so when you think about the league just across the board, do you think athletes have a duty to give back to their, not only their communities, but to the communities of the teams that they play for? See, honestly, I think it comes down to the individual. You know, a lot of people have developed, like myself, have developed great bonds with the communities that we play in. And because of that, you know, these people that come out, they're supporting you, you know, through thick or thin, and you see something like COVID come and, you know, impact people, you're like, you know, I want to give back to all those people that, you know, are in the stands or the person at the restaurant who's closed and all of these different types of things. So, you know, I think that a lot of athletes, they're always going to give back to home because that's where they came from. That, that's what made them. But especially in these communities that we play in, uh, you just develop that bond that you want to give back. Yeah, that connection to community seems like a foundational element to who you are, you know, even from your story to growing up to now. So I love that thread and, and how you've kept it as a core pillar of yourself. So um, I want to talk about economic empowerment, right? You mentioned it earlier. You know, there's so many pillars into to how do we close the gap and disparities. There's healthcare, there's education, you know, there's a lot of pieces, but economics, you know, is a huge one. So you know, you've been an investor, you, you've worked with different companies, but recently uh, you were appointed to the board of First National Bank. So I want to hear a little bit more about how that came about and kind of your role and, and what you want to do with that. Yeah, well, First National Bank, that was that was my hometown bank. Um, my very first bank account. I, 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 still, I still bank with them. But when I got, when I left college and I went to the NBA, I just started to um, be intrigued with business. And at the center of all commerce is the bank. And uh, I really wanted to really learn how that industry works, uh, the access that it provides its clients and how it serves people. And First National had always done a great job with me. And so I reached out to them. Um, I had been watching that bank from a while, just reading research reports and you know, I had become an investor and, you know, after I went to their board, they were able to, you know, bring me on. And it's been a, it's been a great uh, relationship so far. 
I feel like you're, you just, you're doing so many things, especially as an athlete. And, you know, the more and more I think about athletes, right, more than an athlete, right, you're involved with First National Bank, you're on the board for the NBA, um, you are also an executive producer. And, you know, as these young guys are starting to come up no that was pretty cool i thought i thought that was extremely cool um i haven't seen it yet on netflix but i'm gonna check it out what what are you telling these young guys as you kind of are starting to get into more of that mentor role and they're coming up and just all these other things that they can get involved in and do besides basketball the biggest thing that you know i tell young guys that are on my team or young guys that ask me is really to reach out to people that you look up to and ask them to teach you something. You know, you may have a question that you may want to ask, but just ask them to teach you about their business, right? It's so hard to become an expert at a million different industries a million different verticals, but you can always reach out to people who you respect or people whose opinions that you value and say, look, you're an expert in this industry. I will never be an expert, but I would love to learn from you. And that's been one of uh, I got that advice at a very young age, I guess you could say, when I got to the league. I didn't necessarily adhere to that, but as I got older, I really started to reach out to those people and just tap in with them. And uh, it's been a great learning experience for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially, you know, being in Silicon Valley and in, in other markets that you've been in and working with good, you know, head governors as well. Um, so I, I, I want to just ask you about how you educate yourself outside of reaching out to people and, and having different mentors. Like how do you stay educated, whether it's on business, whether it's on social justice, uh, because those are, those are big meaty topics, right? So what do you do to continue to pour into yourself and, and educate yourself? Right, right behind me, really. Um, I, I like to read. You know, that, that was the biggest thing, you know, when, you know, I left college, um, I was able to kind of just dictate my own schedule. You know, yes, I, I played video games, 2K and all of that, but it was also like, you know, how can I, you know, exercise my mind and just reading different books about a, a bunch of different things, whether it's about, um, because I was living in Oakland, whether it was the Black Panthers, whether it was about Silicon Valley, because that was right up the road, whether it was about, um, you know, just, just a normal, just a normal book that has, you know, all the light we cannot see, which is which is one of my favorite books. You know, just whatever book it may be, um, just always trying to just expand your mind and and do something different. So that was something that I kind of picked up when I left school. It's something that's always kind of just been you know a building block for me. There, it's just it's just reading and um, something that I've always tried to do. Uh, Harrison, so I know you talk a lot about your wife and just how you guys are a team and not only how much she supports you, but how much she does. And what is that like to not only have a strong woman by your side, but a strong black woman who pushes you? We have a great partnership. You know, a lot of, you know, what we do is not necessarily her supporting me. It's us working in tandem together. Um, you know, recently she just opened up her own her own small business, um, Good Body, the hair salon in Oakland. So, you know, she has a bunch of different ideas and a bunch of different um, strategies, not only for business, but in philanthropy. And, you know, it's been great to really build with somebody through all of these things because, you know, there's nothing that I'm doing, you know, from a business or philanthropy perspective that she doesn't have an input on as well. Well, we, we appreciate your time, man. Uh, good luck in this season starting up. I know it's a short window to get back, but we're going to be rooting for you and, and excited for it to start back up. I mean, I appreciate the time, guys. Thank you very much. This week's work is to check out the Dream Defenders at dreamdefenders.org. They were founded in 2012 after the tragic killing of Trayvon Martin, and they've been putting in the work for the community ever since. Check out their platform, The Freedom Papers. It spans from everything from criminal justice reform, healthcare, and other issues plaguing our society today. Thanks for tuning in and make sure you subscribe on all your favorite platforms. OT is everywhere, fam. I'm talking worldwide. So rep your city with the OT City Tees. You see I'm holding down New York. Yeah, you know that's right. And don't forget to subscribe over here and check out more fire videos over here. You know what it is. It's Big O.